And good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Lawrence, director of the Clow Center, which has put together this spring symposium on journalism and democracy. Please, if you're facing, if your back is to the stage, please come and, and sit at one of these tables so that you don't have to crane your neck. Um, that would be preferable. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming to today's luncheon keynote address with Pulitzer Prize winning author Ron Suskind, whom we are truly honored to have here today. I am thrilled that we will get to hear from him. I am also especially delighted that Kimberly Atkins Store has agreed to serve as his discussant and moderator of the conversation today. Let me briefly introduce Kim before she takes over this session and introduces our main speaker. Kimberly Atkins Store is a senior opinion writer at the Boston Globe and a columnist. She is also an MBC, MSNBC contributor, a guest host for the NPR WBUR On Point show, and co-host of the weekly Politicon legal news podcast, Sisters in Law. Sisters in Law. Kim was the first Washington, D.C.-based news correspondent for WBUR Boston. She also served as the Boston Herald's Washington bureau chief and as guest host of the C-SPAN morning call-in show, Washington Journal. She has appeared as a political commentator on a host of national and international television and radio networks. She is, in short, an ideal discussant for this session Thank you for being here, and welcome to Boston College, Kim. Thank you so much for that introduction. No one delivers stories that shape our time, like Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, author, and filmmaker, Ron Suskind the legendary journalist with sources atop both parties, the US government, corporate America, and among foreign leaders, provides actionable information about where we stand and where we're headed. That is unmatched. At the same time, NPR call, calls him, quote, a master storyteller with the lyricism of a poet. The fact that he is both an indefatigable investigator and lyrical narrator is what makes Mr. Suskind so stunningly unique and makes his work in print and in movies among the era's most consequential and deeply affecting. For three decades, with prize-winning stories, books, and films, Mr. Suskind's work has shaped the nation's views about race and opportunity, the war on terror, and America's loss of moral authority, the disastrous rise of disinformation, the great crash of 08, and the Obama presidency, and the power of neurodiversity. Historians cite Mr. Suskind's at, Mr. Suskind as among Americans America's most consequential storytellers of the late 20th and early 21st century. Please join me in welcoming Ron Suskind. Wow, that was so nice. I'd love to meet that guy. Who is that? <laughs> okay, I'm going to hang out down here if this is okay, because it's, it's high up there. Um, and I'm short. This is better for me. Um, gosh. You know, it's interesting, you know, when I hear the investigative reporter and storytelling combination being unique, I, in a way, it is less and less so, and I think that's uh, a kind of victory. Uh, I have found over the years that uh, you know, the thing between our ears is really just a story machine. And that the best way to deliver the evidence of a day is in a framework of story. Now, you know, in my life, I ended up sort of uh, competing with, you know, the King Kong of uh, hardcover offerings, Bob Woodward. 
I kind of got into this, like a lot of guys my age and women, because, you know, Bob and Carl, when I am very impressionable as a teenager, you know, we're in a movie. And like, gosh, I want to do that. I mean, it was astonishing, really. A whole generation of journalists go, that's it. So I can do that. I'll be like an avatar of truth. I can like oppose authority. Someone will pay me for that. And I can change history. Now, that's kind of the thing that got me in. Once you got in, though, you started to see the complications of having people tell you the essential and deeper truths. You know, it's an earlier time. There wasn't talk of message like there would become, essentially, the driving principle. Message, truth, no one believes in truth. They believe in message. We're going to give you the message. Now, ultimately, in the early days, decades ago, folks wouldn't lie to a reporter. I mean, it was bad policy. They'd catch you on it. And there was an accountability if you were caught in a lie. And it hurt. And it mattered. That was a time, now I'm going to sound like, you know, some old fart thinking about the 20th century and the days of yore. But in which, look, it wasn't perfect, but we were generally sitting around a set of campfires in this country, America. Not everyone was included, and a lot of people were, were, were dramatically excluded. But on balance, we were all drinking from that same fountain in the United States. 22 and a half minutes, we're watching the campfire at night. Walter, Huntley and Brinkley, we're all there. Scotty Reston from Mike Royster at the Wall Street Journal. I mean, there was a community of people, highly trained, to say, here is what you need to know. Deeply contextualized offerings, by the way. Because it's not just the facts. That's not what it's all about at its core. It's about how the facts live in a context. That context is everything. There's a zillion facts. Here are the ones that are presented for you. At least we had that at the foundation upon which we could really have discussions of what mattered. It's interesting, I, I've, I'm at Harvard these days, and I you know some historian buddies over there, and I, and I asked one of them, I said, look, around the late, you know, 1790, 1780, was there any term they used back then uh, that's the equivalent of business model? <laughs> and this guy, he's a historian, he searched around, yeah, I don't think so. They called it commercial enterprise, they had some commercial words, because, you know, we are the only profession mentioned in the Bill of Rights, okay, for a reason. Without us, it doesn't work. It really doesn't. And we are a unique profession. But we can't be essentially the captive of large economic interests or supported by a government. We needed a business model. Now, back then, they knew Franklin, who was a great media player of his age. They're like, yeah, they sell ads in Port Richards Almanac. You bet, that works. And it worked for a few hundred years. Until it didn't. So where are we now? We have this essential profession. Without it, without what we do. Informed consent. Holding the powerful accountable. None of those things are operative. Really. And when 90% of the essential business model, ad sales, was taken by the monopolies of the West Coast, and Craigslist took out classifieds, and it all became digital subs, we started to enter the age of peril. Real trouble. That's, that's already two decades long. You go to America now, other than the giant flagships on the coastlines, and there are only a few, in which you're meeting news deserts, everywhere you go. I mean, that was once a paper with reporters. 
often reporters in and of the community who knew the community, bringing local news. So we're not just debating all the matters national, with actually, in most cases, no real outcome or participation fundamentally. People saying, this is your community, and I'm here to be essentially the voice of the shared. I mean, I see papers and there's, I said, where are the reporters? Well, these two. I'm like, two? Years ago, there was 20. Those two can, they can only report, well, next to nothing. Fundamentally, we're dealing with big, giant structural changes in the United States, in the way things have been, and the way things they now are. And we kind of don't have, let's just say, the organized, coherent, <laughs> national purpose and principle to create some key structural changes that are needed. But we're in what I consider a Gutenberg moment, all right? I mean, as anyone can tell you, the century and a half after Gutenberg, 150 years, was a time of havoc as well. You know, mostly prior to that, the nobles, the priests, the others, they told everyone, here is the thing that's true. All of a sudden, people were printing and reading and writing, and, and it was an explosion, significantly of religious wars, because people imputed what God or the voice of God meant, and that meant, I'm going to fight you. We're in a moment that's not very, very different from that now. It took a while for institutions to grow up, even in that time, to manage the extraordinary explosion of reading and thinking, of information and its passage. We are right now struggling with the shaping, creating, reviving, renewing of institutions in this time. We're just a few chapters into it. I imagine it's going to go on all through the 21st century. But some things are fundamental. You know, I had rules that I still live by, sitting with folks, some of whom are profoundly repugnant to civilized society people with destructive intent, folks who are mouthpieces for Al-Qaeda, for instance, people who have very, very specific views of me, someone like me, Jewish journalists from the East Coast. He said, talk to me. Tell me your good enough reasons. It's my good enough reasons rule. People do what they do Think what they think for good enough reasons. What are they? Teach me. And if you, if you can be taught that, you can know a person almost as well as you can know another. If you, if you convince them that you are a worthy recipient of the good enough reasons. I've used that through my entire life. Often, frankly, forced to because I'm sitting with someone and say, I just don't get it. I don't understand why you feel and see what you do. Until I do, I can't really write fully representing who you are. And I come from a time where I said it's okay for me to try to represent. All right? I understand that the world has significantly shifted to say, no, no, the actor themselves should be the representative of their perspective. Again. I have an old world root in I can get close. As you know, I wrote a book, Hope in the Unseen. I followed a young man from a very difficult urban school in Washington, D.C. to Brown University. He's black, I'm white. I said, teach me. And he did. And his mother did. And his pastor did. Could I ever know what someone else's perspective is really like? what it's like to be in their shoes. No. In those days, I said, but close is good. Close is progress. Close also lets me to say, I get it. And I also know how to offer it 
to folks who are not essentially speaking your language, because I know that language too. And that's what journalists, I think, generally do know. They are multi-dialectical. They know many languages. And they find ways, when we do what we do at our best, to find shared language. I get it. Let me offer essentially my translation and why you do what you do. Because when you do that, people actually stand very, very often in a place beyond swift and facile judgment. I kind of get it now. At this point, we are actually in a crisis. We're in a crisis because the ways in which everything was happening significantly is not happening in that way now. I've talked to many of the folks who pillaged the Capitol on January 6th. As you know, I wrote that story right before the election in the New York Times, which predicted there would be insurrection. Donald Trump at some point would activate this army personally alleged to him. I was on Colbert the Thursday before the 2016 election when uh, I talked about that final thing Donald Trump did in the debate with Hillary Clinton, where he was asked, would you accept the verdict of the American people? And he's like, I don't know, maybe not. I'll keep you in suspense. Anyone can do it, Trump. It's easy. You do this first song, and then that. <laughs> I said to Stephen, that's a threat. That's what it is. He's already said, I can shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue, and no one would care. He already essentially warned us. My people are bonded to me in a new way. No one in your lifetime has this kind of grip on his adherence. And maybe I won't accept it. Then what? I said, you know, I said, look, not since probably the Civil War have we had a political actor speaking in this parlance. It's like, and I did a manageable Trump. I mean, not Colbert level. It's sort of like, <laughs> you've got a nice democracy. It'd be terrible if something bad happened to it. It was really the first expression of Trump with a mobster's mentality and structure, which is the way he ran his business and the way he kind of ran the White House. Jump ahead. 2020. Then 2021. You know, many of those folks who ransacked Congress, well, they believed what Donald Trump had said to them. There was no one with a counterpoint. No one they could hear or listen to or believe. They believe they're patriots. I'm like, how do you get there? How do you get there? How do we figure out a way <laughs> for them not to arrive at that place? The fundamental challenge that we face now, dis and misinformation, I mean, at this point in this divided landscape, profoundly tribal, fractured media environment, alternative realities. As some of you know, in 2004, a first glimmer of the future emerges in a piece I wrote for the New York Times Magazine right before the 2004 election. A lot was happening. Uh, obviously, I was an investigator of weapons of mass destruction, of a false case for war, all of those things. And I talked to someone in the White House who will remain nameless forever, off the record, and offered a not for attribution offering from that. Where well, they said, I was a member of the reality based community. I'm like, what? What is it? If I'm a member of it, what is it? You believe, Ron, that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. I'm like, yeah, there's a history behind, you know, Age of Reason, the Greeks, I think, too. Enlightenment, I, that's. My department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we get that. But you see, that's not the way the world's working anymore. See, when we act, well, we create a reality. 
circles the globe 10 times before you have breakfast. Shapes attitude, shapes action. There's no one to call us to say no, no. Not really. No arbiter lives in that place anymore. I said, huh. But you know, reality will assert itself at some point. Oh, maybe. Which reality? Choose. Reality-based community. There it was. Alternative realities. 2004. We're way down the path from that now, aren't we? How do we fight it? How do we change it? It's the greatest challenge of our time. Truly. I don't have any easy answers. I've got some answers. None of them are all the way to working. I'll tell you this, though. (laughs) When I have off-the-record conversations with people, they're pretty truthful with me. Even folks who say astonishing things in public. When you look at the text explosion from Fox News, that's just off the record. That's all that is. Lots of people talking like they really talk when you get them in a place of safety and privacy. How do we get that out? How do we get that out into the wider public? How do we find a way to say, the thing that you and I said to each other, that covers essential truths that I know you believe. Now, that's nothing you can say in sunlight. I get that. You're a member of a tribe, and with tribal membership comes a script, and you stick to it. But we're in a different place now. You see what I see. The sun is still rising in the east, correct? Yeah. Where does this end up? Well, where it's going is not good. What's your feeling about the growth of autocratic urgency and principle in America? Well, that scares me. Well, what are we going to do about it? I can't do anything in public, Ron. I mean, I've got to wake up. This is a member of the House GOP said this to me. I got to wake up in the morning, Ron, and I've got to say the sun rises in the west and the earth's flat. Otherwise, I lose my job. I'm out. I'm done. And worse, I may be under threat. Me and my family. There is a time now which we didn't have in any other time of my lifetime in which people are accepting Political violence is part of the equation. That is our equation of democracy. What I said in that piece of the New York Times is that at some point, the army alleged to Donald Trump will be activated if he needs it. He will trigger them. He can do it in all kinds of ways without any fingerprints. But they are his, really. And there are right now tens of millions of people who will say, tell me where to go. We follow you. All those folks who we've been listening to, Levitsky, Ziplat, How Democracies Die, the great Tim Snyder at Yale, Jerome Stanley, I mean, they all say the same thing. Liberal to illiberal to autocracy. How does it happen? I ask them all that question. They're like, well, we're right in between now. We're kind of in that gray area. A slide is occurring. I said, how does it get reversed? Well, it usually is a matter of what was once the other party, which has now largely been hijacked and radicalized. I mean, there's always a rump of them left. And that rump needs to find union with whatever its longtime opponents were for the greater purpose of pushing out, essentially, the violent faction that continues to grow. Saying, no, 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 we are not going to ride across the river on the back of that. We're going to be eaten halfway. We're going to merge up with our longtime opponents to say, no, no, no. That's not who America can be. That's not who we are. And then, and then, generally, the slide is arrested. 
That's where we are now. That's where we are. 2024, most important election of our lifetimes. Nothing close. I thought 2020 was that. So did Bob. So did Woodward. We talked about this. He's like, this is the big one, Ron. The most important election, Ron, of my lifetime. I said, I agree, Bob. No, it's now 2024. Journalism, truth. Do we even use that word anymore? I think we should. We do our best effort, our best effort at offering what is contextualized truth to the public. Yes, there is a truth. We handle it with care. We offer our caveats. This is all I can know. This is my best understanding of where that lives in a context that I've worked diligently and professionally with real skills to say, there, this is my best offering to you in this present tense. It's not something that everyone knows how to do. You know, you remember, some of you were reporters, when you were a young reporter, you had to learn this. You had to learn how to do it. You had to learn how to listen. You don't want to say, really, explain that to me. I don't get it. Oh, I see. Can I check that out? Is that confirmable? That's, those are principles, professional principles to offer this thing of extraordinary value upon which I submit the democracy rests. Now I'm preaching and I'm, I didn't intend to. But I'm up nights these days. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll spend time with someone with with a fiery set of beliefs that the United States government should be overthrown, that a certain person is a savior, that he essentially is chosen by forces beyond us. I'm like, hmm, okay. So um, tell me a little about your life. I want to get to know you. Before we go any further, <laughs> uh, this is your job. How's that going? Tell me about your kids. I'll, you know anything about me. I, it's not a one-way street with me. You can know as much about me as I do about you. It's not I'm answering the, asking the questions and you get to answer. Tell me something funny. What do you love? Favorite movie? See if it's a match with mine. It's a way that humans talk to each other and do pretty, a, a pretty good job, one-to-one. -one. Actually, we're really good at that. We nod, our mirror neurons mirror each other. Really. When was the time that uh, you disappointed your parents and it was okay? What's the lesson of your favorite teacher that's still in your head? What would you say if you could talk to her now? She was right here with us, Mrs. Harker in 11th grade. <laughs> That'd be great. What did she see in you that she could help you learn and grow? I'm not sure, but she trusted that I could learn. We're talking, really talking. And what happens? I find that the tribal garb starts to slip off. I find the script that they walked in with is discarded. It's the only way to do it. The only way to get at those good enough reasons. It's hard work. We need a business model to fund us doing it. It's not something you can do like that. It's something that takes us using our highest level skills to get at the essential thing that we share that then sits in a context along with the things that we fight over. Those things together, that's what progress, it happens then. I'm gonna get up here with Kim in a second. And, uh, and I'd like to open this up to questions from the room. 
But here's what makes me hopeful. No one wants to be lied to. No one. No one wants to be misled. Ever. (laughs) If you can help people see when that's happening, you're having a real conversation. How do you do it? Lots of ways. But we need to do that writ large, broadly, nationally, everywhere, if we're going to make it out of this. Because those are alternative realities. Some of them are ferocious in what they impel people to do. And finally, the key is that what I've learned, and some of it against my will, is that we are identical, all of us in the essential ways. (laughs) Everyone I talk to, they're, they're just like us. They really are. Now, where they sit, what they believe, massive distinctions. But ultimately, This is about us, meeting us, finding a way to say, okay, the whole game is about compromise. (laughs) The whole game is about, okay, I can work that out. (laughs) You know what the Jesuits say? We're here, BC. What's the Jesuit principle? First thing you do is find someone in your opponent's argument that you agree with anything. See if they then match you. And that's how a conversation begins. It's an extraordinary principle, a humanistic principle. And it's the kind of principles that have saved us again and again. And if we're lucky and maybe find a business model, it may save journalism. Thanks. Okay. Well, like a skilled journalist, you've already answered most of the questions that I had planned on asking you uh, (laughs) from the top. So uh, I will just try to be my uh, best journalist right now and just sort of dig deeper in what you've already um, explored in that, um, in those very, very um, interesting opening remarks and revealing. I was thinking about the title of this, uh, of this symposium. It's about journalism and democracy. And I thought about it, and yes, I, I understand that the press is the only industry protected in the Constitution expressly. And I understand that we are the fourth estate, but I'm not sure when I began my journalism career a quarter century ago that I thought about my job as being a part of democracy. (laughs) And do you think that that is part of the issue? And and for you, when you were covering, you know, presidents and and power holders, did you think about your role as helping to further or protect democracy? And if not, when did that change? Well, that's really interesting, Kim, because, you know, I, when I'm starting out, I'm not seeing question marks and challenges to the thing I did. It just was like, yes, the press, part of the mix, essential. Uh, So I never really thought that much about it. You know, obviously when you're sitting with presidents and presidents are saying, here's what I believe and here's what's essential, you're getting it down, it's part of the democratic process for them essentially through you in those days to speak out to the vast public to inform consent, to nourish it. Uh, and, but, but I'll tell you something interesting. As you, even as you say that, I'm saying, you know, First Amendment, what are the big three? Speech, assembly, press. They're kind of conglomerated now. Some of these things that were once separate are like, I mean, what's one word? Assembly? 
different. I mean, they're <laughs> smushed together, actually, into a, almost a single set of expressions and actions. And that's very different, actually. I mean, just think about how the digital landscape works. I write a story. It's shared. People are assembling, connected to each other, just like you are in an assemblage. Is that speech? Is that the press? Try to differentiate them. Sometimes it's very difficult now. Everyone can be a journalist. Yeah, I'm speaking out. What's my, what's my, you know, my Twitter following? That's something we haven't thought a lot about, actually. What happens when those three anchors, speech, assembly, and press, get smushed together? And I think we need to think about how to maybe separate them or draw lines that help us understand they are distinct and they're not conglomerated in, in many ways that are quite dangerous now, I, I would submit. They are all rights. <laughs> But the way they're exploding is, is something no one could have figured out. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, I didn't think about the important role we have and the challenges that role now faces until really recently. Until really recently. So, yeah. And, and so, before we can explore how to do things better. Yeah. Uh, how to see what's coming next. We need to talk a little bit about some of the things that might have gone wrong before in the way that we did our work. I mean, when I went to Washington uh, 16, 17 years ago now, as a reporter having worked here in um, covering the Boston City Hall in the Massachusetts State, ha State House, the one thing that struck me about the journalists in Washington is they seemed awful chummy. Mm. awfully chummy mm. with the people that they covered in a way that I just, I, you, that's not how you do it. You hold them at arm's length and you have to. Do you think that is a part of why we ended up in this place where both the institution of journalism and democracy are in such a perilous mm. place? Were we not, Objectivity is not the right word, but what we not being objective enough in our in our coverage. Look, that's a great point. It's a great point. I mean, uh, so I'm at the Wall Street Journal as a national affairs guy in '93. Through that decade, I, I consider that pre-digital. All right, just um, you know, there was a lot of chumminess. Uh, it was something you would pay for. Uh, and maybe in relationships, <laughs> if you created a kaboom, yeah. like saying, hey, that emperor has no clothes, and I'm going to say it, or this thing is a disaster, and try to challenge me on it. I have the facts. That's part of what was a problem. But there was another side of it, too. You had relationships in which people were actually pretty frank with you. You know, again, it was mostly off the record. But I developed hundreds of sources who would tell me the truth. I really needed them. Big complex things, often grand pronouncements of policy and message. And I'm like, we need to talk. And they would. Those relationships were essential for me, essential. They just ed edified me. So then I knew context. You see, that's the key. They helped me get context. But also, you got to cut some throats. You got to say, hey, guess what? We have a relationship, source and reporter. But I actually speak to a different master. All right? And they're out there. And. I'm sorry, Bob, what you're doing is a disaster. I think you know it, don't you? Yeah, kind of. Good. That's my confirmation. That's the way the planet kind of worked. Not badly. Right. Some deficits, but not badly. Those relationships were essential. It's hard now. It's hard now because <laughs> they essentially, everyone is responding to their own audiences. Yeah. Like everyone, 
every person in every level. And that's been going on for a, a long time. This isn't something that Certainly it's new. 20 years, yeah. a good 20. I mean, I don't think it really pops until around 2006, 7, where Facebook explodes. Yeah. And then all Facebook's children follow. And then you're like, wow, this is really different. I mean, people have vast followings. I mean, a hundred times the circulation of my newspaper. And they're really talking directly to that audience. Yeah. Uh, oh, and, boy. And the access changed. I mean, you were talking about the access and the importance of that. I don't know. In, I really saw that access change in the Obama administration, where you used to be able to get people on the phone and talk off the record. And then they just started show, sending you videos that they posted on their... So it's like, wait a minute. No, that's not... That's right. <laughs> that's not information. But it's sort of like, oh, it's an end round. It's an end round, the press, that you don't like the, those guardrails. Yeah. And they're taking it directly to the people. So essentially what Donald Trump did was just take that times 100 with Twitter. Right. But that had been going on for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I still have enormous faith in the off-the-record conversation because I still have them all the time. Yeah. And they are honest conversations. They are. You know, face-to-face, -face, generally, they are honest. And, and all honest conversations, I, said, I think, are interesting, yeah. actually. And they know that if they mislead you or say something that is not fundamentally true, especially when they're off the record and they're safe, that it'll be a breach in a conversation and, and in a way, a source reporter relationship. They don't want to do that. The truth is out there. Let's just leave it at that. The truth is out there in all of the areas that concern us. So you talked about the truth uh, as contextualized truth. So are we teaching journalism wrong? Are we thinking about journalism wrong? I mean, when I was in journalism school, it was about the facts. You, you get the facts, the who, what, where, and you kept yourself out of it. It wasn't about uh, adding all that context. That was for the audience, the reader or the viewer, to do on their own. Have we been doing it wrong? Look, I would say that, that all facts have to live in a context in which they have their proper placement. The size of this, the scope of that. Does this really mean this? And does this have this effect? When I talk about context, that's significantly what I'm talking about. The exposition in which the facts are delivered that are largely explanatory as to the way things work. I mean, I have way the world works tests that I use all the time. I employ them to say this is basically our best understanding of the way the world works. And here are the facts that are pertinent in that realm. Now, the question you ask though is, is there more? I need to say is here are my beliefs here, is my, here are my prejudices. Here are the ones that I'm not going to be able to excise and put on the table, but that shape the way I see the world. Uh, do I need to essentially disclose them to the reader to know the chair from which I sit? I think that's sound to do and important. It's important for us to do self-knowledge, to say, this is why I think what I think. This is what I see and why I see it, the way I do from this chair, from this skin, from this place, from this age, from this sex, essential. I mean, life on exam is not worth living. We learned that in 11th grade philosophy. That's the essential role of the journals to know that about yourself. Yeah. So you can be hyper aware of all the ways that they may in fact alter, change, the offering. Um, but ultimately, I think that we can get to a place as reporters, as journalists, in which that self-knowledge and that understanding, often hard clarity as to who you are, uh, allows you to get to this, this sunlit uplands in which you are able to say, here's what I believe and why, but here's what I've learned and here's what I know, and here's what I can check and source and rely on there. 
Here are the questions this raises in me. That's fine too. They may be the questions it raises in you. But all of that is the way journalism can work now with much more of our self-knowledge being a part of the mix to make sure that it is the thing needed. I want to save time for questions that anyone uh, may have. You can just raise your hand and uh, we'll bring a microphone to you. Anybody have a, a question they want to ask? I have a ton, so I can keep going. Okay, we have one right here. Your microphone's right behind you. Oh, thank you. My name's Kay Schlossman. I'm a longtime political science faculty member. You raised the, the issue of the, f the folks from Fox News who divulged that what they were saying publicly was different from what they really believed. And that's an example from sort of one side of the aisle of the spectrum. Are there examples from the other side of the same kind of phenomenon? Oh, for sure. It comes, it goes from both directions. Oh, gosh, yes. I mean, I'm, the key is get to everyone you can. <laughs> and when I hear it from one side or the other, I say the same thing. Now, how do we get this insight that is significantly not spoken in sunlight, but believed by you and you and you and all of them? How do we get this out into the place public? Both sides, both sides. Now, I would say that there is not, in many areas though, the kind of equivalencies that some people offer or promote in this time. The left and the right are not equivalent in key characteristics in this era, period, okay? You know, I'm on all the shows, and sometimes I'll go on shows where they know I wrote a tough book on Obama, and they say, oh, okay, we can have you on the Red Show. They're actually a little different. I find for the, the shows I go on on the left, they generally don't mess around with fundamental facts. They really don't. I mean, they shape it, they frame it, they give opinions around it, but they tend to, many of them, be folks who like, you know, still, they won high school debate tournaments. They still see themselves that way. They tend to stick to these are the verifiable facts. Sometimes on the other side, I find less and less of that. But the narratives that they offer are enormously powerful. Let's be clear on that. You know, Donald Trump didn't get 74 million votes by putting an ad in the classifieds. Okay, he didn't. You've got to respect the power of narratives. Some of these stories are enormously affecting. They speak to people, to their grievance. Think of it this way. The two most successful politicians of the 21st century, I would submit, are Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. Populist, both of them. Speaking in wildly different ways <laughs> to significantly shared grievance. I look at the two of them together. Couldn't be more different. I think one's a Democrat and one's an autocrat. Start there. But the fact is, they're both speaking to fundamental structural issues in the United States at this point. Of class, of race, of haves and have nots, of people feeling like the system's rigged against them. They both use the word rigged a lot. And when I hear that, I'm like, hmm, okay, there's something there. When I hear that shared word and I see the response, that each of them get when they use it. That's the way you start to dig deeper. I mean, my whole, I, I pay mortgages on going deep. I love all my Daily Reporter buddies. They have a different model and a different mandate. They gotta be filing all the time. I say, I can wait. I can go a year. I can go deep, deep, deep and talk, 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 and listen, listen, listen. 
and try to get to something that then frames the daily coverage. There are other people who do that too. I think that's essential in this time to do. Essential. But is it harder in this time to do? I mean, I'm, I'm speaking um, as a journalist who is obviously a woman, a person of color. Will I be able to dig deep in, for example, the thing that uh, federal authorities say presents the greatest domestic threat to America, which is radicalized white nationalist domestic terror? Mm -hmm. Are they going to talk to me? Is that going to be? Uh, I have people who used to talk to me when my byline was in the Boston Herald yeah. who no longer do, and people who vice versa now that my byline is in the Globe. How do you start those? How do you get over those barriers to even start those discussions? Well, you know, uh, will they talk to you? Mostly not. I would tell reporters at the Wall Street Journal and buddies of mine at the New York Times, I say, there's always a way in. Now, for some, there's not. But you'll find among them some in which that can happen. Don't have to be a lot. Say, can I enter? I know we disagree. I know you see me as an enemy. Nowadays, many of them do. Well, they're told that we're the enemy. Absolutely. Let me in. You know, as you know, we built technologies that allow, I created a, a, something in the New York Times two years ago during COVID where people can talk off the record to each other and I capture it. They wear masks and they speak in a subbed voice. It's just a way to get off the record conversations into not for attribution. And we're rolling it out to lots of the big media companies now to create a digital product, frankly that gets to the deeper truths that we hear. Look, we all know this, every reporter in the room, the best stuff is off the record. The stuff where we are in a place of honesty and safety with the source. Now, obviously, we're going to vet it and do all the things we do as journalists before anyone sees it. But how do we get more of that out into a place in which there's a, essentially a journalistic product that people go, ah, there it is. I'm hearing it. But it's going to be a battle to get in there. You know, I was talking to 1% Doctrine for the book. I was talking to one of uh, the mouthpieces of Al-Qaeda in London, one of the radical clerics. And he knew I was. He looked me up on the internet. It was the internet at that point. But came out in, you know, late aughts, 2008. And uh, I said, let's not talk about any of that. First. Uh, any movies you like? Movies? Yeah, any movies. Yeah, I love Pulp Fiction. I said, terrific. We actually spent a half an hour talking about Pulp Fiction, me and the jihadist. I still have a relationship with him. We started to talk. He had a great take on Tarantino, by the way. I mean, real, real depth of insight. It's hard to do. It also takes... A, us opening up, each of us, to go, I am now going to come in, my pores open, to s try to find the good enough reasons. Where are they hiding? Tell me. I'll be careful. I'll be careful with them. I'll, I'll handle them delicately and with respect. And you find there always are some reasons that you can mostly understand. <laughs> um, you know, all these things are mixed together. We know that. The loss of faith in institutions, mis and disinformation, the challenge to journalism. But ultimately, they all converge in the notion of I can understand you. And the thing that you give me from that exchange, human to human, is something that I can bring out into sunlight. And then we have it to go, huh, I got it. 
I mean, I did a thing, I'll just finish with this. I, I did a, a TED Talk some years ago, and, uh, and Tom Kane, the former New Jersey governor, uh, was, uh, did one right before me. And I didn't know this, but he was a high school teacher before he became governor. And he was on the 9-11 Commission with Lee Hamilton. Again, a bit of an earlier period when, when it wasn't a matter of my only victory is your defeat. There were bipartisan things that happened, you know, the tax bill of 86. I mean, and Lee and Tom did a great job with the 9-11 Commission. So here, here is Kane saying, you know what I used to teach in my history class is that it's always compromise. It's all, the whole system is built for compromise, literally. The House and the Senate are compromises between the big states and the little states. In its structure, it's about that. And we've managed to find the shared ground enough of it in every instance except 1860, right? Right now, we are angling toward a period that is looking frighteningly similar in certain ways to the divisions that were the country back in the 19th century. Humans are amazingly ingenious and adaptive we will find a way out of it. I believe that. We are very, very good at bending towards sunlight, as do all living things. My wife says, try to be more hopeful. <laughs> I said, I think the evidence supports it. So I can be. Thanks for hanging out today.